Today, my presentation that I'm going to uh, share with all of you is really meant to help you look at portraiture in a little bit of a different way. Uh, because I know when I first started as a portrait photographer, I thought that it, my job was really to take a picture of what someone looks like. Which, okay, right, it's a portrait. It sounds like that's right, but not, not really. Uh, instead, what I do now is I take a picture of who someone is, but I show it visually. Or I take a photograph of the fantasy of what someone would like to be, or a, it's a dream that they have. And so I don't create images where someone shows up, sits down, I snap a photo, walk away, and sell images. Because what's important to me is I don't want to be a commodity. I don't want to do volume. I want to create quality, and I want to create pieces of art, works of art. So that's what I specialize in. So as a fashion photographer here in New York, you might think, OK, well, wait, this is a portrait class. You're a fashion photographer. Yes and yes, <laughs> both of those things are true. Um, as a fashion photographer, I shoot a lot of different things. So I will shoot uh, beauty campaigns, and I'll shoot purses and clothing and anything related to fashion. That, of course, is the stuff that pays the big bucks. Anytime it's, it's commercial, anytime it's uh, with a brand, that's what's going to pay you more. But what I actually do most often, the, the things that I'm hired for regularly, is portraiture. But it is fashion-inspired portraiture, or it's, it's portraiture that, that you would be happy to hang on your wall as a piece of art, not just a close-up of your face, but, but something that makes a statement, something that reflects who you are, something that fits with the decor, something that's timeless. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, now, one of the reasons I, I like this as well is not only do I shoot fewer but of higher quality, but I also charge a lot, lot more because I'm doing a concept development and we're telling a story and we're producing it. So that's what I'm going to share with all of you guys today. Uh, for example, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about portraits as a work of art. It's not, it's not something that can just happen. You have to make it happen. You have to develop the concept. So this was actually a senior portrait of a girl who had done a senior portrait before, didn't like it, and so we did her fantasy senior portrait. And so it's dress up and it's mood and it's concept. And uh, this was a portrait that I did recently of a ballerina. And so it's a portrait, but it's something more. It, it's, it's, a, it's something you could say, yeah, no, I, I could see that in a gallery, or I could see that hanging on my wall. And so that's kind of the, the twist that I want to take. And as you look at these images, you'll notice they all, like, they're all a little different. Some are brightly colored, and some of them are soft, and some of them are more gentle. There's not a right or wrong way. So when I'm sharing this with you guys, I don't want you to think about it as a technique, like do these lighting techniques in order to do what Lindsay does. I want you to think about it as a, a state of mind. What can I do to plan a shot, develop a concept that is something more and that has more of my artistic touch to it? Um, so to give you an example, this was uh, for a portrait of a woman that came to town for her wedding anniversary. And she brought her, her whole family. She had her husband and her kids. And so she wanted to have an, a print, an image that was huge above her mantle place and that would be worthy of her mantle place. And so we discussed. We had a call. We discussed her family, what their passions are, who they are. Um, what her house looks like, what color palette she liked, all of those things. And so I came up with an image just for her, just for her family. Um, this was actually shot in the Brooklyn Historical Library. Um, so, man, you should have seen how, I, this is apparently the going rate to rent any space in New York City is like $12,000. Like I tried to call, I'm not kidding, I called like all these libraries and they're like, yes, $12,000 to rent. And I'm like, are you serious? And then like later on, I've got a castle shoot. So I called like the mansions. This one was not that. <laughs> okay. um, and I'm going to tell you about the fact that you don't need to spend a lot of money. It's more the way that you wire your, your brain, not how much money they spend. And uh, something that's very important that I try to do is I want things to look expensive, but they don't necessarily have to be expensive. And so that's what I, I'm always keeping in mind for my portrait sessions. Um, and so again, piece of artwork, something you could hang on your wall. Guess what this thing behind your head is? piece of cardboard, <laughs> but it looks expensive. And so that helps me create my artwork and do so affordably for myself and my subjects. Um, by the way, guys, if you want to see this presentation um, again, obviously you can watch it on the B&H uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but also, if you go to this link, I have got the notes from today, so you can review that. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to be editing two photographs, and I have the actions 
or it's actually presets in Lightroom that I'm using to tone and color those actions. So if you want to try out what I did at home, you can go to that link, totally free, you can download that. Uh, and by the way, while people are writing that down, that is actually what's going to be happening today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my frame of mind, how I plan portraits as art. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see portraits as art in, in action. And that's why you see the setup here and the gear here. And I'm going to take you through all of that. I'll tell you um, the lights I use, the cameras I use, the lenses I use, the print, like all of that so you can see the entire process from start to finish. So hopefully everyone will be able to take away something useful for their own work. So that being said, um, these are the brands that are, are sponsoring me and bringing me here today, but I'm not putting them up on the board because they're sponsoring me. What I did is with B&H, I was planning this shoot, this presentation, and these are the brands that I actually use to bring my artwork to life. And so I will explain these step by step so you guys will see when I'm actually using what I rely upon. So when you come into my studio, just around the corner here in New York, this is all the gear that you would already see set up. I have that printer, these are actually my lights, I have, so we'll go through all of that for you. So my thought process is this. For me as a portrait photographer, I'm really in it for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons I'm in it is to create artwork. Like that's what's fulfilling to me. But I'm also in it to make other people look and feel their best. And it's extremely rewarding to do so. And so I'm gonna tell you about how I do that for my portrait clients. And one of the ways I do this is if I'm, if I'm trying to help them look and feel their best, I turn my portraits into an experience. It's not like I have you in the seat from 1 to 2 o'clock and then get out of here, you're done. Instead, we have a conversation beforehand. I get to know my clients. I get to know my portrait subjects. What are they passionate about? Um, what are they looking for out of their images? And so some, one of the things that you should do when someone hires you is you should always ask, why you're getting, why they're getting their portrait taken and why you as a photographer. Because that reveals a lot. Different people are getting a portrait for different reasons. Maybe they're getting their portrait taken because, you know what, it's been rough in life recently and they, they just wanna, they wanna feel better, they wanna feel beautiful, they wanna feel their self-worth, so then it's your job to help them do that even more and they can give you insight into that. Or maybe they're celebrating a milestone, a birthday, a time in their life, an accomplishment, an award, I don't, and you can celebrate that in the images. And then why you? Why did they pick you? Is it because the way that you treated them or made them feel? Or is it a specific uh, way that you light? Or is it the color? Or is it the posing? What is it? Because then I can showcase that even more. And so I make it an experience. And I am a, a fashion photographer here in New York. I've been here now for just about eight years. But I've had a portrait studio. I've had a business for 16 years now, 15 and a half years. And I started my business uh, in upstate New York in a city or around a city uh, called Binghamton. And people go, oh, you've got the, this fancy clothing and this lighting and like these, you can only get that in New York. Uh, no, <laughs> like it's, it's not, that's not the case. As I already said, I want to make it look expensive, but it doesn't need to be expensive. And I absolutely marketed this approach, fashion techniques for portraits or yourself as a work of art when I lived in rural uh, in a rural area. So again, this can apply to you as well. And what I would do is I would encourage people on their shoot day, go take care of yourself. Go to the spa in the morning, have a nice lunch. Afterwards, go out to dinner since you have your hair and makeup done and you're feeling all fabulous. Like I want it to be an experience that you don't hire me because you want the commodity to come in and out. You want it because you're making something special and it's important to you. So that's how I treat my business. So let me give you guys an idea. If someone reaches out to me today and says, hey, Lindsay, I'm interested in hiring you for a portrait, which, hey, guys, feel free, <laughs> okay, um, you're welcome to. But if they reach out to me, this is what they're going to get. This is some samples from the packet that they get. And so what I don't do is I don't have a form on my site where I say, hey, people, pay me. Like, here's my prices. You get these photos. Because that's very commodity driven when it's like this print equals this cost. No, 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 you're hiring me for the experience and the concept we're developing. So it's, you don't get hit by the price first. And instead, it is your portrait investment and it's the guide to your experience. So let me just take you through what this guide looks like. And uh, this is in the presentation, so if you guys go download the notes, you'll be able to look at this a little closer and take a look at what I've written there. But I try to make it personal and I try to explain to them why they're hiring me as a portrait photographer, why they should be interested and what I do differently than other people. And the reason this isn't so important is now everyone's a photographer. Gear is great, and a lot of it's inexpensive, and a lot of it can take really good pictures simply. 
So I got to do more than just take a picture of what someone looks like. I have to develop a concept. I have to tell a story. I have to maybe offer an experience. Like, what is it that I do extra so that I can charge extra? And that's what helps my business grow. For the longest time, when I lived in upstate New York, I was competing on price. And I wasn't growing and I was struggling. But when I stopped competing on price, that's when my business grew. And that's also when I grew as an artist. Because I wasn't trying to get people in and out of the seat and shoot as many as possible. I was giving them time. I was giving them attention. I was developing concepts. And I loved my images that much more. And so that's what I do today. So let's take a look at this guide. Uh, the first thing on the right hand side is a message from me. And this message talks about why I think portrait photography is important. And I, my idea is that I want people to start to get an idea of why I'm so passionate about my craft and why I believe in what I do. And so I talk about one of the reasons you might be getting a portrait is because you are celebrating a special time in your life. And I respect that and I'll celebrate it with you. Or maybe you're one of those portrait photographers out there who doesn't have a good family portrait. You know, or you, and so it's a special time for that. Or maybe you're a photographer who's, and not that I market to photographers, but maybe you're one of those whose family won't let you shoot them. So it's like, I just need a picture of my family, so why don't you just do it? <laughs> that, that could be too. Uh, but if you actually take a look at it, what I really say is I say, whatever your reason, I'm going to make, I'm going to respect that it's important to me, and I'm going to help you create images for that. So I talk about it being to lift you up or to celebrate or to commemorate a special moment. And in it, something I think is very important is I talk about my experience being photographed. For my 30th birthday a couple years ago, um, I asked all of my portrait photographer friends to take my picture. And I did so for a couple reasons. One of the reasons I did so is I, I wanted to celebrate the milestone in my life. And I wanted to celebrate, I felt like I'd finally grown into myself as an adult. It was like the real start of adulthood to me. So I wanted pictures to commemorate that. But I also wanted to feel what it felt like on the other side of the camera. And if you haven't done it, it is terrifying and awful. It's so vulnerable. And I was really surprised because I know how, like I, I know, I'm a photographer, I know how this, how this all works. But I found myself, like they'd say like, you know, turn to the right and put your shoulder down. I'd be like, like this? I'm like, was this right? Like, I was trying to do a good job and I didn't know, and I just felt vulnerable. And then it would be like, um, it would see them look in the back of their camera and I'd be like, oh God, what did I do wrong? Like, it's, it's a very vulnerable thing. And so I also talk about the fact that I realize that it can be vulnerable and I've got you. I've got you. I'll take care of you. I'll make you feel comfortable. I want you to feel comfortable. And the other thing is I talk about how important the shoot, shoot was to me after the fact. How I love the image, I cherish them, and it, it made such a big difference. So I do think it's important, if you can, to speak about the importance of portrait photography to you. And if you are a portrait photographer who has a crappy portrait of yourself on your website and your social media, you have to fix it because it's showing you don't respect your own craft. So I recommend that you trade with other photographers and, and do this so that, that people realize you respect it. If, they're asking, if you're asking them to pay for it, something that you respect. Um, so I start off with that message. And then we get to the next page. I like this because all of this is leading up to the shoot day, right? So I'm showing, hey, there is a lot going into the shoot, and this is why I can charge so much, right? It's not just you show up, I snap it, you go, here's the digital files. It's not like that. There's a, there's a whole process to it. So to give you an idea, up in the, the beginning here, I say we begin with an email consultation or a phone consultation. Um, to figure out why you're having this shoot done and what your goals are. Maybe it's personal branding, you're trying to rebrand yourself, or maybe it's a celebration. Okay, so we figure that out. And then we talk about other things. I want to learn more about what you're passionate about, visuals you're attracted to, color palette that you like best or maybe fits best in your house. Um, we start talking about wardrobe, hair and makeup, and all of that. So these are all considerations that I have. So this takes me to my next point. I am a fashion photographer, but I don't say this because I'm a fashion photographer. Clothing is so much more important than you think it is. Because if somebody shows up in clothing that doesn't photograph well, you are working so much harder than you have to. And so I always let subjects know what they should be wearing to shoot and what's most flattering. Uh, now, there's a couple different ways that you can handle this. Uh, for example, what I, I've got, like on Pinterest, I've got some Pinterest boards of clothing 
that are inspiration of what you know is flattering, what's not flattering. I list things that you shouldn't wear. Um, but I also will send people to websites like Rent the Runway. And so Rent the Runway, you can rent beautiful gowns. You can rent it in a couple different sizes or size and a backup size that gives them these beautiful designer gowns that they can wear for their portrait shoot, but they don't have to spend a lot of money. Another thing that I'll do is I will ask them to pick their five or 10 different images or five or 10 different outfits, take selfies of themselves in a mirror and send them to me because I can see if they're going the right direction. And for example, this sweater that I'm wearing here, it's fine, it matches my dress, I think it looks nice. If you photograph me in this, you, it's, it's gonna be real difficult because it's big and baggy and flowy and you're never going to be able to see my form, my contours, it's going to be really difficult to pose without me looking like a blob. The average person doesn't know that and so you need to be able to help coach them what makes your job easier. I also have the discussion of hair and makeup in there. When you hire me to create a portrait as art, you as a woman, if you're a woman, you cannot hire me without having your hair and makeup done. Like it's, it's, it's just not even an option. And one of the reasons why is every, everybody has their, their imperfections or, or and it, they have the issues with their skin and they show up and all they're thinking about is please don't shoot this pimple. But they'll say, oh God, it broke out today. Or, or man, like, oh man, I, my, my wrinkles are really showing or the bags under my eyes. And they're focused on negative, 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 negative. And I'm trying to help them look and feel their best and they walk in feeling insecure. And they walk in feeling self-conscious. And, and I, I need to break down that barrier. And so if you hire me, you have to have your hair and makeup done. But think about how much more of a, your job is easier because let's say a woman wants to look and feel sexy. And she shows up with her hair frizzed out, a little bit of eyeliner on, some cover up. Like she's not gonna be able to look and feel the part. But when she's got that beautiful wavy hair and the bright red lip and the big lashes, all of a sudden she's feeling it. She's feeling herself in the mirror and she's checking it out. And now when I pose her and I'm trying to get those emotions, she's already that person. And it makes my job so much easier. And so now it's not even an option anymore. I don't want people worried about what they look like. I want them to already know they look like a, the best version of themselves. And I'm going to make it even better with my photographs. So hair and makeup is all part of that. So I take them through the concept development, the color palette. And we talk about hair and makeup. And then over here on the shoot day, I talk about what it's like. Um, a typical shoot for me is somewhere in the three to five hour range. But also that includes hair and makeup time. So hair and makeup time, they come in and we talk and we chat and they have coffee and then maybe we get hair and makeup done. So from start to finish, it's three to five hours, which again, so I'm not doing, I'm not doing bulk. I'm not doing volume. I'm doing fewer, but with a lot of concept development to it. And then I tell them what to expect after the shoot. And I've got little details in there about how, discussing retouching and, and, you know, helping them really bring out their best. So this is an example here. The girl tells me she wants something a little sexier, a little bit more grown up, and she shows up with a picture on the left, if you don't get hair and makeup done, there's only so much you can do. And that doesn't mean she's not beautiful, but she's not channeling that persona. These two pictures were both taken with window light. And then this is just heavily styled. And she's, it's a totally different vibe. And you should, should, have, should have seen how she carried herself differently as soon as she was looking at herself in the mirror. So if you underestimate makeup, you're really missing out on part of the whole process. So what I would like to get into is portraiture as art. So what are the things that have made me a better photographer? When I first started portrait photography, I was not thinking about portraits as art. Um, my original setup, I had two lights, I had two umbrellas, one on the left, one on the right, and I had four poses that I'd cycle them through and then change their, their expression. And that was it, there was nothing beyond that. And now I have ideas and storytelling and there's emotion and there's mood and there's drama and there's all of that. And I create works of art. And so these are the three main ways that I, the three main elements that help me create portraits as art. So we're gonna talk about those. The very first one is to develop a concept. I cannot, like I, I cannot emphasize this enough that when I meet so many different photographers, I look at their work all the time there's many photographers that are good, but what holds them back from great is not technique, it is not gear. The, what holds them back from great is concept, always. 
is that they shot a picture that looked pretty, but they led with the wrong questions. And I always recommend you lead with, what is this picture about, or why am I shooting this image? That's what people miss. Because what photographers start with is, what lens am I going to shoot with first, and how am I going to light it, not, What's my idea and what lens is most appropriate or what light brings out the best in that idea? They go, they go about it all the wrong way. They know how they want to light and then they force it on the person. And that's kind of what's fallen flat. So um, here's an example that I, I see all, all the time when I look at people's work. And this is what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll see a photograph where all of the pieces individually are good. So there, uh, I've seen this photo where there's a girl and she's wearing like a, she's wearing a, a silver futuristic looking dress. It's a cool dress, okay? And she's standing out in a field in backlight, like beautiful backlight, beautiful field. It's a pretty field, it's pretty light, okay? Good so far. Um, but then, uh, so she's got her hair big, kind of teased out in fun shape. Cool looking hair. Um, and then she's got a cat eye, a really nice, like sexy makeup, and then like a really soft, flattering pose. But what you've got is you've got a girl in a futuristic outfit standing in a field with a soft pose, sexy makeup, and teased out hair. They don't fit together. Individually, the parts can be cool, but you didn't ask yourself what this image is, image is about. And so everything you do, your lens and your background and the color and everything you choose needs to be in service of what the image is about. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be profound. It's not like you need to have some massive narrative, but this is what people miss because then you base everything off of the why, like what the picture is about. You choose the clothing that best suits your concept and the posing that best suits your concept and the colors that best suit your concept. And so you lead with your idea. And that's, that's, what, that's what separates people that are good from great, always, is they have a more refined concept. And so this is an example. I'm not talking about it needs to be a complicated concept. But this was meant to be a little bit more of a dramatic uh, maternity image with the maroon themed colors. So not like, it's not like there's a story or anything to it, but because it's more dramatic, we go for dramatic light and dramatic hair. And then because it's dramatic, we pick a dramatic color with a dramatic matching background. It, it's, like, it's not that I'm saying that the, it's a story and there's a, a pregnant woman and she's on the, this, the hill. and the, It's not like I need a story for a concept, but it's about curve, maternity, color, and drama. There was an idea there. Um, and one of the reasons I, I come up with ideas and I can do something a little more interesting is because I actually get to know my subjects. Um, I try to get to know something about them, who they are, what they're passionate about, not just come in, sit down, got your head shot, and leave. Uh, I, I mean, and that's completely valid if people shoot that type of photography, but you're not going to create works of art. It's, it's not going to be that way. And so I get to know my subjects and my clients. And this takes me to the next level of what I find takes a photographer from good to great. And this is another thing that is really, really, really hard to teach. And what that is, is personal skills. The ability to relate to people, make your, your subjects feel comfortable, make them feel like you, you care about them. Because most people, a lot of photographers were real concerned about the settings and the light and the gear and, and the composition is in the hand in the right place. And then we're forgetting that there's a human being over here feeling super vulnerable. And so that's the next thing that, that takes you up at a level. And so there's a couple ways that I get to know my clients. Um, one of them is that pre-email, pre-phone call conversation to get to know what they're passionate about. And the number one thing I'm trying to figure out is that, like, what do you wake up for in the morning? Like, what is it, what is it that excites you? What is it that fuels you? What is it, what is it that you would do if you could do anything with tomorrow? What would you do tomorrow? And so I try to figure out what people are passionate about. Because then I get an insight into who they are, and I get an insight into what's, passion, what they're, what's important to them, what they're passionate about. Um, and if you're one of those people that struggles with interacting with your subjects and getting them to feel comfortable, and, I, and that's one of the questions I get most often. Sure, I get questions about lighting and lens choice, but I get, well, how do you get your subjects to relax? Um, I mean, there are many different things, but one of the things is, of course, genuinely caring about them and, and wanting to know and getting to know them 
instead of just sitting them there. And, and there's a book that I recommend you read. It's a very, very, very old book, but its uh, lessons are as true as always, and it's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, and the lessons in that book, I think, apply so much to how we interact with our subjects and our clients, and people just forget. Um, and it's something as simple as, one of the lines in there is, the sweetest sound in the entire world to someone is the sound of their own name. And so when I'm photographing someone, I try to use their name often because it's just like an emotional massage. <laughs> and it feels like, yes, you're important. Yes, I care about you. Yes, I'm here with you. Um, and when I got my portrait taken for my birthday, I remember when they would say my name, I'd go, and it's just this silly thing. Um, gentlemen, I'm, I'm telling you secrets here, but if you say a woman's name, she always melts. Like, it's not like she might not meet, but like, oh, Lindsay. And you, yeah, <laughs> like, it's always that feeling. So use the name often. And there's so many other things in that book, but one of them is genuinely caring about people and being interested in what they're interested in, even if it's not something that you um, were already interested in. So get to know your clients. And the, the reason for me doing is, A, I want them to be comfortable. I want them to know I care about them. I want to bring out the best in them. But it helps me come up with ideas. It helps me come up with ideas for the concepts for my art. Because people ask me all the time, well, how do you keep coming up with ideas? Well, I, I get inspired from my client, right, from my subject, because I'm figuring out what they love, what they're passionate about. Can I take that and turn that into a photograph? Um, so it's what are they passionate about? What do they value? And so here's an example. Uh, this is a mother, uh, a mother and daughter. And uh, I'm actually photographing them uh, again soon. And when I photographed them the first time, I asked them about themselves. What do, you, what do you and your daughter have in common, and why are you taking this portrait? Like, why did you hire me, and why right now? Um, and they were celebrating an accomplishment for the daughter. And so they told me the story. And basically, what had happened is uh, the mom, when, she was when the daughter was growing up, the mom always taught dance. Like, she was a dance instructor always. And because of kids, <laughs> like how they are, uh, her daughter was not interested in dance because mom taught dance. Like, it was just like, OK. I'm not doing it because mom wants me to. And so she, like, time goes on. Um, and it was something like when she was 16 or 17, she finally took a dance class from someone else, not mom, and instantly fell in love. And actually, now she's a professional ballerina, like here in New York. Uh, and so what we were celebrating is we were celebrating the new, uh, this particular shoot was actually for um, a new dance company that she recently joined. Uh, and so they wanted to create an image that conveyed this celebration of dance, but also the mom being part of being part of her and helping her to achieve this, because the mom later on uh, obviously helped her. And so this was the image that, that I made. Um, and so if you look at it, it's not like they need to be in tutus and up on a, on a stage to perform that. It's an elegant, timeless portrait, but she's got point shoes and it's very dance. And if you look, mom's leading the way. Um, so again, there's a concept there, and I use them to inspire me. And it's a little bit more timeless. This was not complicated. This was one giant umbrella on the right-hand side. So fashion or, or fine art lighting, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's big and soft, but it's about the storytelling and the styling in this one. And again, there's many different ways that you can shoot it. You can do things that are soft and painterly. You can do things that are colorful and dramatic. Take these ideas and use it for your style and what makes you different. So my first step, of course, um, was to develop a concept. Like, what's your idea? And I think an important way to do that is to get to know your subjects. Uh, another thing that is extremely important, and I know this from the fashion world, is that if you want good images, like really powerful images, you have to plan ahead. And that doesn't mean I'm sketching out the pose and the exact lighting and the every, but I'm giving myself more to work with. So when I show up, there there are there are more things around this concept. So uh, one time when I was in college, I heard Joe McNally. He came to speak in school. And he gave a presentation. And one of the things he said is, it was roughly like this, um, that he went to uh, a photo editor. And the photo editor said to him, if you want to be a better photographer, the next step is go stand in front of more interesting stuff. He's like, you got the technique down, but the things you're shooting are just not interesting. And so, OK, granted, I'm not saying go pick more interesting clients. Like, that's not what I'm trying to say. But if they just show up, and then they're in their little zebra print off the shoulder dress, that's all you have to work with. And if it's just them in the solid background you have, that's it. 
But maybe if you have an idea, you can coach them on what type of clothing to bring, or you can have them get their hair and makeup done beforehand, or you bring a prop, or you plan out the color, or you things like that. You're giving your, so you're not standing in front of more interesting stuff. You're putting more interesting stuff in front of you to work with and be inspired by. So it's planning ahead. Uh, in fashion photography, we make the images, we don't take the images, and we do something called mood boards. Mood boards are a collection of images all based on a theme. And so when I do a fashion shoot for a magazine, for a brand, every single shoot I do has a mood board. I'll have pictures for the type of hair and makeup that I want, some pictures for the type of wardrobe, uh, maybe a little bit for lighting or props, or like whatever I need to make this shoot. I've got it on an inspiration board. Sometimes people call it inspiration boards, mood boards, vision boards. It's all the same thing. So every fashion shoot that I do has a mood board. But guess what? Every single portrait shoot that I do has a mood board because it gets everyone on the same page and then I can start piecing my ideas together and then tell the client what they need to bring. And so I can kind of give you an example here. Uh, this was years ago, like many years ago. I was photographing this little girl um, and her mom said in, in the, you know, the pre-interview and the discussion, you know, she loves the movie Grease. I said, okay, perfect. Let's do a shoot. Let's do a concept around that. So my mood board was this, real simple, not like a huge profound concept. But I said to the mom, I found this kind of like greaser looking outfit. And I said to the mom, find something like that. Like, it doesn't have to be exact, but find something like that. And you can find anything on the internet. So I give the mom the duty to find that. And then I plan out some kind of funky hair like this, something a little different. And so our portrait looked like this. Like this was her portrait. And it's fun and it's funky and it's different. And what I like about that is that keyword that it's different. Because now I'm not competing with everyone based on price or product, but on idea and the different experience that I have to offer and the different types of images that I have to offer. And so that's my idea for portraits as art. Uh, here's another example. So in this, we wanted to do a bridal themed, or uh, a, a butterfly fantasy themed bridal shoot. And so uh, in the past, what I've done is, I don't shoot as many, I don't really shoot weddings anymore. But what I will do is I'll do conceptual shoots before or after the wedding day. Because then we can play dress up, we can create those images that maybe on the day of they didn't have the time to shoot, but something huge and fantasy and creative and unusual and a piece of artwork. So when we planned this out, um, what we decided with the butterflies were inspired by these kind of images. Uh, what we did is we ha I had my friend make a headpiece. Okay, here's what the headpiece is. She took one of those pieces of, of like styrofoam in a ball, cut it in half and cored out the center so it made a like a thing to put on the head. And then what she did is she bought, uh, they're about, like I think they're like a dollar a piece, these little butterflies. And she hot glued gun them to cheap little pieces of wire and then stuck them in the styrofoam. So now all of a sudden we have this big butterfly headpiece that looks fantasy and it looks creative. We plan out this mood board and then this is kind of our, our bridal uh, fantasy shot. Like I said, it was, it's, it's uh, styrofoam and then all of these butterflies stuck in there in wire. But again, it doesn't have to be expensive to look expensive. And I think that looks expensive and it looks fantasy. Uh, for these butterflies flying around here, I held out the butterfly in my hand and I took a picture. And then in Photoshop, I blurred the edges so it looked like it was flying. And I changed the size and I, like, I took a bunch of pictures and I moved it around at different angles. Uh, but if I didn't have the concept in mind, I wouldn't have known to do that in the moment, and I wouldn't have planned ahead to have the headpiece made, and, 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 all of that. Uh, in fact, I even picked a solid green background. It was like green uh, shrubs behind her, because I knew it'd be easy to change the green to purple versus if it was you know, trees in the background and a lot of different texture. But because I knew what I wanted, then it made it easier to shoot. Uh, I'm gonna just give you even more ideas. So this was another client shoot. Um, this is a photographer. She does fine art and boudoir. She actually has uh, this whole series of images that she does that's uh, it's like Renaissance themed. It's kind of fairy tale Renaissance. She photographs her daughter a lot and, and tells stories with that. And her name's Jessica Lark, great photographer. And uh, she was one of those photographers guilty of not having a good family portrait. And so the shoot concept that I came up with her, for her, I'm quite sure would not be the same concept that I'd come up with with you, or with you, or with you. I'm sure our concepts would be very different because when I started having the conversation, what do you want for your mantelpiece? Uh, I would ask her questions, what are you passionate about? And she loves her artwork and she loves those Renaissance themes. I said, okay, we could do something that 
looks a little old fashioned. Then she described her husband. Her husband actually, he's in the military, and he actually has a sword with his family crest on it. Okay, this is cool. And then I talked to them, and their favorite TV show is Game of Thrones. And so I said, all right, this is it. We're doing, we're doing Game of Thrones. She's like, yeah, Game of Thrones family portrait. So we did the Game of Thrones family portrait. But to get that to work, I had to do a lot of planning, right? Like it's not something I could just show up and do. And so what we did is um, we picked out some wardrobe that's rented from um, costume rental. Costume rental, there's also theater rental companies. There's companies that specifically rent for Shakespearean plays. Like that's what the companies exist for. And there's amazing dresses. One of them I've, I've worked with before is Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Like the, there's, there's all these different com companies that exist just for that reason. So we rented these pieces, we planned out hair and makeup, and then I started doing my research. And again, I tried to find like castles or mansions in New York. That was a no-go. <laughs> So I went to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and so we drove out, and we found this place, um, the Mercer Museum. It's, it was like half library, half museum, but it looked just like a castle. So we called up, and we planned that out. And so this was their family portrait. And again, not every shoot that I do is this complicated. Sometimes when they tell me the concept of the shoot, a turtleneck, one light, and a gray background is the right look for their shoot. And then other times, this funky family, this is actually the right look for their shoe. Um, so this was uh, one side of their, their holiday card, actually. And so this isn't composited. This is actually what the shot looked like. But it's heavily color graded, meaning I've heavily changed the colors. And so the picture on the left is what it looked like to my eye. Picture on the right is how I colored it. Uh, how it's lit is a Profoto B1, a portable studio strobe, on the right hand side with this umbrella right here. So it's basically my big portable softbox. And then on the left-hand side, I have another light pointed up because I didn't want to lose the archways. And I wanted to give it a little bit of mood and a little bit of color. So again, is this the appropriate family portrait for everyone? No, but it is definitely a work of art. And I think she has it as a 36-inch print above her mantel place. Um, so it's a work of art for her, but a different family. I'd shoot an entirely different way. And you saw at the beginning the way that I shot the mother and daughter. Another family portrait, not the same feel. All right, so the last part of this equation is I talked about the idea that you want to come up with a concept. Like, what's, what's the idea behind the shoot? What, why are you shooting this image? Ask that yourself that question. The next part of that is you've got to plan ahead. Planning ahead might be with wardrobe. And guess what? Wardrobe doesn't need to be expensive. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But you'd be amazed at the beautiful dresses you can make out of tulle or the really inexpensive dresses that you can style up and fancy up that you can buy for a few dollars on Amazon. It's more about it looking expensive, but most people don't know how to dress and style themselves. So you gotta think about style. And I love this quote, elegance is the only beauty that never goes out of style. So you don't need to do extravagant, you don't need to go over the top, but timeless, elegant, and beautiful, they'll always love, it'll always be beautiful. And so I often plan that in my shoots. Um, so for example, this is, this is a, a girl that I photographed recently. She looks like a little girl on the left, and she looks like a sophisticated young lady on the right. And it's not a complicated dress or expensive dress. I think it's a dress that she got from Macy's. But it's beautiful, and it changes the look. And there was concept around color. And if you take a look, this is actually what the setup looked like, in case you wanted to know. I think the lighting looks elegant, but it's not complicated. It's one large softbox, on the, or one large umbrella with diffusion, like you have here, on the right-hand side, and then a large white reflector on the left to fill in the shadows. But the styling makes that picture look much better. Um, also, related to all of this, this week, finally, my fifth book comes out on posing. And I actually go through how to get these types of poses, and I talk about what I'm looking for to create flattering and more elegant and stylized portraits, but particularly focused on the posing. So that comes out this week. I haven't had my own copy yet, but I will soon. All right, but I've gone through all these things, and I have found photographers, so many of them, make more excuses than anyone I've ever heard ever. And it's always the excuses that hold people back. I've heard every excuse ever where the, it's where I live, this doesn't fly. I was in like upstate New York where the population was like 10,000 in the little town I was in. And I did fashion styled portraits. Or, oh, well, I don't have this expensive gear. 
I can do things with natural light that look stunning. Okay, so that doesn't work. But the one that I hear often is when people look at my work, they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's expensive clothing and you live in New York. No, <laughs> it's not about that. And so the key that I want you to keep in mind is looking expensive doesn't have to mean being expensive. You don't have to break the bank. And so let's take a look at just a couple of things here. Um, so I bought this top, and I have several of these, on Amazon.com for $14.99 but it looks timeless and it looks elegant. It's the, that just beautiful off the shoulder line. And this is a simple setup, two lights, an umbrella on the right, and then a grid, just a little bit of pop of light on the background. So it's two lights and a $15 shirt. So you can't use expensive as an excuse. So here's another one. I love this picture. It's, it's uh, dramatic and it's, um, it's, it's dreamy. And I made most of it. So let's take a look. Uh, first of all, this is how much it costs. It's one light. It's another big umbrella. $15 a tool and $8 a flower. And so to see what I actually did to make this dress, she's wearing um, a really cheap uh, leotard, like nothing fancy. And then we took a piece of fabric. And we tied it around her waist. And then we took big pieces of tool, cut them, and then you just tuck it in. And all of a sudden, it looks like this big full dress. So we took the big umbrella a white reflector, I'd have her curl up in the ground, we'd cover in flour, and then she would just throw it. Uh, somebody, when I've shown this before, said, yeah, well, holy crap, how the heck do you uh, clean up after that mess? Uh, you know, I, sh I did shoot this in my studio, but there's no reason this can't be shot outside, because if, if you're just, like, it's just flour on the ground, you could shoot this in your driveway, put up a background behind, and shoot it out on location. You make the skirt super cheap, and you buy cheap flour. So again, no excuses not to get creative. And then here's one more of a shoot that I just put up on my Instagram account. I really like it because it's bold, it's graphic, it's modern but timeless. Like it, it kind of feels vintage. Like you can't quite place it. I like those because I know those images will last. And so I look at this, and what I mean, obviously, what makes this shot is the, sh the shadows. But man, that awesome headpiece. It's avant-garde. It's creative. It's unusual. And um, it's made out of $25 worth of IKEA placemats. <laughs> so let's take a look. These, spray painted black, and then we took uh, little pieces of wire and bobby pins and built it up on the head. So it's all about being creative. And when you, well, I find that creativity is a muscle. The more that you practice, the more that you exercise that muscle, the stronger it gets. And so I know, when I go through, when I go through a uh, craft store, when I go through uh, I mean, any of these stores, I'm like, ooh, that'd make a good headpiece. And it's, it's a wreath that you're meant to stick like flowers and plants in. Or, or I'll see this and it's like, it's a, the one thing I used once was detail on the face and it was meant to be felt that you stick on the outside of potted plants to decorate them. Like you, you go there and you see these things and out of context, you don't know that it's cheap. You don't know that it's out of place. It just looks creative and it looks expensive. So no excuses on that front because you can barter and trade. You can make it yourself or go simple. If it photographs well, that's all that counts. So again, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to pop over and I'm going to shoot two images and show you start to finish the gear that I use, my lens choice, like everything from start to finish. So if you guys have any questions on that, I would be happy uh, to answer them. If, if you want to learn more about some of the retouching that I'm going to do later, or you want to see more of tutorials on some of these shoots that I've done, I have a website, Learn with Lindsay. And if you just want totally free stuff, on my blog, I update weekly with behind the scenes of my shoots where I list the gear, the behind the scenes images, the diagrams, everything you need. See, so there's always something fun to see and learn. Uh, and then again, for anyone who missed it, this is where you can get today's class notes as well as actions for later on. All right, guys, so um, let's start with where I told you to start. Um, the idea behind this is you need to have a concept. Now, the concept could be based on what I know about Imani, which uh, it could be about a passion or something, or it could just be a conceptual image with her as the subject. Um, I look at her and she's strong and she's regal and she's beautiful. So the concept behind this shoot is she is a golden queen. And so then when I think of this, everything I do 
should be based off of that concept. The clothing I choose, the background that I choose, the poses I choose, the camera angle I choose, all of that should be based around the idea of a golden queen. Now in my head when I was thinking about this, there are two different directions that I could go, I think. And I mean stylistically you guys could do something else, but I thought I could either go kind of timeless, like an old painting, you know, if it's going for queen, I don't need to do a lot of crazy lighting because I've already got a lot going on in her outfit. So in fact, I could probably keep the background simple and the lighting very simple. I don't need to go over the top. Or I could go super over the top and have a gold background and have gels and have all that stuff. I don't think an in-between would work because it, it, if it's in-between, like there's kind of a lot of stuff going on. Like, I, I say commit to it, whatever you're going for. Simple and elegant, simplify, make it elegant. Crazy and over the top, commit to it, but everything needs to work together. So I've decided for photographing her that I'm going to go for the timeless look. Um, she's got this elegant, timeless face, and so that's kind of what I want to focus on. So let's talk about all of the pieces. Uh, the first thing, if I'm going for warm tones and golden, then I've selected a warm tone and golden background. And so the background that I have here, um, it's a brown background. This one's uh, hand painted and it's by Gravity Backdrops. I already know that it's, it's warm, but it's not super warm. So if I wanted to warm it up more, I could warm it up more in post-processing or I could throw a gel on it, maybe like a little bit of a yellow, give it a little bit more warmth to it, but we'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's, let's build the entire shoot. Um, the next thing is the styling. So we've selected styling that's golden, beautiful golden glitter everywhere. And then to go with the queen concept, we have her little crown in her head. So we've got all of that golden. Um, all right, so now let's talk about lighting. Uh, so the lighting that I use, if you go to my studio, the lighting that I use for everything is my Profoto D1 Air 500 watts. There's a few reasons that I use Profoto. Um, for the longest time, I used other brands. You can still get beautiful images with other brands, but for me, it's about what's important. And a couple things that are important. One of them is my modifiers. There's so many different modifiers to choose from. They're high quality modifiers. And if there's something I don't have, I can always rent pro photo modifiers, but you can't rent a lot of other ones. Uh, the next thing that is super useful to me is actually, let's grab this, how the modifiers go on and off. They go on and off with this, this brilliant quick release on the side. And a lot of other brands that I had in the past what would happen is you'd have to like pinch them, fit in the notches, rotate it, and like then I could never get it, especially when it was a giant softbox and it was just not fun. Um, so I know that when I shoot, I'm very fast paced. I like to move a lot. I'm, I'm bouncing around. So I picked modifiers or I, I help pick, help me to pick Profoto because of that. Um, the other reason is I get really fast recycle times. So you saw the shots where I had the dancer jumping. I need to be able to take a bunch of shots so I can get it recycling and catch her several times throughout that. Or spinning or jumping, it's just the way that I shoot. I'm very active when I shoot. And so you also notice that I won't be on a tripod because when I shoot, I'm doing this. And up and down and I'm trying different angles. I, I mean, I try to look a little less erratic than that and I try to be a little smoother, but I get excited and I'll go, oh, this angle will look good. And I, I want to be able to freely move there. If you shoot a tripod, that's fine, but I wanted to let you know that People that learned that you have to shoot a tripod, that's not necessarily true either. I, I never do when I'm shooting portraits. Um, so um, I shoot the Profoto D1 Air 500 watts. There's two other reasons that I shoot them. 500 watt seconds. Um, I now, I currently have the, the uh, luxury of having a big studio now. But for a really long time, I had a very tiny studio with lots of white walls. And when I had 1,000 watts or really strong strobes, they're so strong in that small space that the light would just go everywhere and I would be shooting at like F16, F22, even when I didn't want to, it's just there was so much light. So I like to shoot with the 500 watts because it gives me a little bit more control and it's not so much. Um, and and uh, if you shoot events or you shoot outdoors or you shoot big groups, that's when it might be appropriate for you to have a little bit higher wattage. The last thing is that I'm a little bit slightly height challenged, a little short. When people meet me in person, they've seen me online, they're always like, they always say, this, there's two things, they always tell me, you're much shorter than I thought. And they said, you're much skinnier than I thought. So apparently online, I look really tall and not skinny. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to take it. 
Um, don't worry, if you said it to me, it's fine. I don't hate you. <laughs> uh, but the other reason um, that I shoot with a, these particular brand is because I use my air remote triggers. So if I've got a big hair light or I've got a light off to the side, I can actually change all the powers of the lights individually from here. So I'm not wasting a lot of time going up and tweaking the lights left and right. Like, it's all controlled from my trigger. All right, so that's to explain the, um, the actual strobes. But let's talk about the modifiers. Um, I'm going to start in this setup with the modifier I use probably most often um, if I'm going for an elegant portrait. I use a large umbrella with diffusion. And the reason that I do this is one of the rules of lighting is the larger the light source is relative to the subject. So a big light source, really close, means it's relatively really big. The larger it is relative to the subject, the softer it is. So if I want really, really soft light, I take that light and I move it in really close. Now, another way that I could get big soft light would be a big soft umbrella, but I'm, ugh, these are so much easier to set up <laughs> like than having to fight with gigantic soft boxes or finding a place to put them. So I love it because it's an umbrella that can pop up quickly. And in particular, why I picked this umbrella is it's a, the particular one I've got is it's a deep umbrella. And so what it's, what it's doing is it's forcing the light out in one direction a little bit more. The light falls off a little bit faster, and it's easier for me to feather. Because right now, in a small space, I can decide whether the light is also hitting the background, if I angle it this way, or with the other feathering, if I feather it across her, I'll still light her, but it won't hit the background. And a lot of those really wide umbrellas, the ones that aren't deep, it just tosses light everywhere and it's a lot harder to feather and to control where the light's going. That's one of the benefits of shooting softboxes. It is easier to feather. So that would be one of the reasons you might choose one over the other. And then this, this diffusion makes it even softer on her face. So if I want that kind of Renaissance look, a lot of that was done. If you think of Rembrandt, I was actually in Rembrandt's studio. I was in his studio um, in Amsterdam last year. And it's just a big bank of windows. So this is my window. And I use this as my window all of the time. So I'm going to keep it nice and close and soft to her. Um, there's two modifiers that you will see on my main light. Pretty much any time you come to my studio, I've got a few that I switch up. But the main one is going to be this and the other one that I'll use in the next setup. So I'll show you the other main modifier that I use. OK, so we're going to pause on lighting for a second. We're going to pop over to gear. All right, I'm going to be shooting with the Canon 5D Mark IV. There are two cameras that I shoot with and I rotate between depending on my needs. Most often I shoot with the 5D Mark IV. It is my workhorse camera. It shoots quickly, it focuses quickly, it's got pretty high megapixel, beautiful color, beautiful uh, range and detail in the images. I love it and it also does fantastic video. So when I am shooting, I can do a moving or a living portrait as well. And that's something that I use for my branding. So if you go to my website, you'll actually be able to see my living photographs. So that's why I use this most often. The other camera that I use is the Canon 5DS. And the Canon 5DS is a 50.6 megapixel camera. So if I'm going to do that picture of the family, the Game of Thrones, that they're going to blow up huge, I'm going to grab my 50 megapixel. If I'm going to shoot in low light, I'm going to grab my 5D Mark IV. Or if I'm shooting close-up macros, this is what I do in fashion photography, I can make the eyelashes look thick as tree trunks when I use a macro lens and the 5DS. So it's like I'm choosing, but most of the time for portraits, 5D Mark IV is what I go, go with. Now there's two lenses that I'm going to be using, and I'm actually probably just going to use one today. It's the one that's the most versatile for the way that I shoot, and I'm going to be shooting the Canon 24 to 105. It's just a super versatile lens because I've got from 24 to 105. And the reason I like it is I already told you I'm super active when I shoot. And I don't really usually need to change lenses very often. Because I can get a pretty decent tight headshot at 105. If I need tighter, I switch over to my other lens choice, which is the 70 to 200, 28. Those are the two lenses I shoot most often. There are exceptions. I'll just tell you real quick. Um, like many of you, I am also a gear nerd. And so I do own like everything. For example, I decided I needed a 16 to 35. I shoot portraits. 
but I wanted one. I have, I have a little bit of everything, and so I'll tell you what I shoot, why I shoot most often. Uh, so the 24 to 105, when I'm shooting in the studio, most of the time uh, I want to be moving and active and keep the flow and connection with my subject, so I keep on the 24 to 105 because I've got a lot of range, and the 24 to 105 is a 4.0. In the studio, I'm not usually shooting wider open than that because I have pretty simple backgrounds. I'm not actually trying to kick the background out of focus. So the 4.0 isn't a problem for me, and the versatility is what I'm really going for. Anytime I need to go above that 105, I grab my 7200. Again, versatility. I love the blur that it gives me in the background. It's sharp. It's a great lens. My exceptions are when I go out on location, Instead of the 24 to 105, a lot of times I do the 24 to 70 because I like to have that 2.8. I have the 24 to 70, 2.8, because for all of you that are here in New York City, you know how when you shoot, there's a garbage can, a taxi cab, and like a dude spitting, like in the background, like <laughs> this is your composition. And so I would like to cast them out of focus, so I tend to shoot with wider aperture lenses, which is why I also have an 85-1.2 and the 50 one two. But if you'd ask what most often you'd see on my camera, it would in fact be these two lenses. So those are what we're going to use today. I'm pretty sure I'm going to lean mostly towards the 24 to 105 because that is like my most versatile go-to lens. Okay. Um, next part of this is tethering. Um, I'm going to be tethering using the Tether Tools tether cable. If any of you have one of these recent cameras with USB 3, okay? Um, USB 3 is has nothing to do with Canon, nothing to do with Tether Tools. USB 3 is just a crappy connection, like the way that it holds in. If you've shot this, you know what I'm talking about. Like it's wiggly. It doesn't like, it doesn't like snap in place. If you've got Canon, if you actually go into your bag, uh, into your original box, there's a little thing that helps hold the tether in that I didn't know existed until I had tether problems. So check out your box for that. Uh, but for the Tether Tools tether cable, consider getting the right angle tether because it's a more stable connection than just the one that goes into the side of it. So what this is going to allow me to do is going to allow me to be shooting directly to my computer. Uh, so the pictures are going to pop up. When I shoot, when I do my images as artwork, my portraits as art, I always shoot tethered. Uh, I shoot tethered because it's gonna help me see details that I wouldn't have seen before. Uh, it allows me to apply presets so as they're coming in, we're getting the mood of it, the feel of it. If I work with a creative team, they can be like, oh wait, the makeup I need to fix or, or whatever it may be. When I'm shooting with the average person, I don't actually face the screen towards them until I got something good. And then what I do to help them feel comfortable, feel happy, I go, oh, I love this shot. And I turn around and I show them, and I'm genuine about it because I am that excited about my photography. But I'm trying to show them that we produce something beautiful together. You did a good job. We're working together. But I don't usually turn it towards them. If I am doing a fashion shoot, I show the model because I'll say, can you fix the hand? And I'll, I'll point to that. Uh, the only time I'll change it is if somebody's like staring over my shoulder, you know, not looking at me and they're paying too much attention to the screen. The other thing that I've got on this tether cable is at the end, I've got this little booster. Um, what happens is when you've got huge files, so with the 5DS, for example, it's 50.6 and I'm shooting raw, so these are huge files. With this long cable, for whatever reason, the, the file, they just, they're going real slow. So when you add the booster, uh, it adds a little bit of electricity, a little bit of pop to it, pulls them in faster. So if you've got, if you're tethering with big files um, and a long cable, you're going to want the booster. So that's what I'm doing for tethering. Okay. The next part of this equation is I'm going to be shooting tethered into Lightroom. Um, I'm going to be shooting with Lightroom CC, and I will also be editing in Photoshop. I always begin in Lightroom and end in Photoshop. I do not do my blemish removal and any of that. In Lightroom. Lightroom for me is your contrast, your exposure, and your color. And then all of the other details I do in Photoshop. Um, the next part of this, however, is if I am managing and editing these files, I edit on a bunch of different computers. I've got my iMac at home, I've got another computer at, at, at work, I've got my laptop, and so if I'm editing on all these different, I really need them to be consistent color. So I use the i1 display as one of my tools for calibrating. I actually have uh, a color monkey as well. Uh, but anyway, so what I do is I make sure the color profiles and the color is consistent on all of the different computers I'm editing on because it's one of those things where it sucks if you edit and you spend hours on one computer and you flip it over to the other and you go, oh, crap, <laughs> it doesn't look right. So it keeps me consistent. And then also, it makes sure I've got the correct color 
for when I print. And the printer that you see here is the one I have in my studio. Uh, it's the Canon Image Prograph Pro 1000. So just it's the Canon Pro 1000. That's what I have. The reason that I like this one is I do print for my portrait clients, but um, as a fashion photographer, I love doing that uh, because what I do is I print out images for a lot of my commercial clients that they actually never get prints. Like when a commercial client hires you, they're not they're not buying prints. But if I print out something really small, they're going to stick it in a drawer and never look at it again. But if I print out something big, they're going to be like, well, what the heck do I do with this? So something that size is really great because it's a showcase of the project we did together, and they're going to hang it up. And it's a thank you. So I just did an eyelash campaign for a big brand last week. When I'm all done and they pick out the images, I'm going to print out my favorite, sign it, and thank each of the account executives that were there for that brand. And that's going to be a thank you to them so they remember me, they see the quality, and it's going to be next time they need a photographer whose print is on the wall. Uh, so I do things like that as well. And you'd be surprised, a lot of portrait clients, they actually will thank you for printing, not just giving them digital files. And one of the reasons is if they've done it before, they know that those pictures don't leave the computer. And then they know they lose them. And they know that they, 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 know that they don't get them printed out. And people are starting to realize that. In the past, you're giving my digital files. That's all I want. I want to print them and not have you do it, not have you charge me now, because time has passed, they're realizing what happened to all those files, all those memories, all of those photos that never made it off the hard drive. So uh, I encourage printing and uh, sell prints to the portrait clients as well. All right, so I think I've got the range of gear. So I'm going to get started with this first lighting setup. And let me check my, perfect, OK. So um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to ask David back there, would you, would you um, dim the lights for me? The reason we're dimming the lights is because I'm going to be using my modeling lights to actually see what the strobes are doing. This is one of the reasons that I'm going to be using studio strobes instead of speed lights or anything like that is because I can really see what is going on as I sculpt the light on the face. All right, so let's take a look at this umbrella on her face first and foremost. This is the only light I have on right now. I'm going to build in this set so you can see it piece by piece. All right. Um, ideally, thank you. Right, that's great. That's perfect. That's perfect. OK. So I've got my 24 to 105. You look beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Let me take a quick test shot here. All right, let's see what the light is doing. OK. So on this first shot, taking a look, you see that the way the light is sculpting on her face, it's really soft, and it's giving her kind of loop lighting. If she turns her head, turn her head towards me just a little bit more. Great. Turns her head here. I can get even more of that, that kind of Rembrandt lighting look. So it'll look more like an old painting, because the shadow of the nose creeps over and meets the shadow of the cheek. OK, so I'm going to analyze. If this is all meant to be warm and gold, it is looking warm and gold, uh, but there's a couple of things that I know that I'll, I'll probably want to change. Uh, so one of the things I know I want to change is um, I think she needs a little bit more light to the shadow side of her face. It's falling to completely black. And if you look at old paintings, there's still detail on the shadow side. Uh, and also for me, for a print, when a good quality print, even the shadows, you can see detail. They're just darker. Uh, so instead of bringing out another light, I don't need to do that. I am going to bring out a white reflector. A white reflector is just going to catch some of the light from this main light, bounce it back towards your face. So Stephen, come up real close for me. Great. And let's try there. Perfect. OK. Let's take a shot. Uh, in my studio, I don't usually use the big reflectors. I actually use uh, white V-flats, so those big pieces of white foam core, because I don't need someone to stand there and hold it. And I can get full length. Stephen, one inch back. Yeah. Thank you. OK. All right, so watch the shadows on the side of her face. And it just opens them up. If I don't want them to be so filled in, I back Steven up further, or I pull my reflector further away. It won't fill him quite as much. Uh, another reason to why I chose this big soft light. All right, if you use a hard light, what you get is you get specular highlights. So you get bright highlights and dark shadows. If you're photographing someone like me, with really, really pale skin. The highlight against my white skin, you'll see it. I mean, it'll be there, but it's not as noticeable. 
But when you photograph darker skin tones, the highlight is against darker skin, so it's more noticeable. So harder light makes more specular highlights, and if that's not what you intended, then it's hard to control. But a softer light is a little less contrasty. The highlights aren't as bright, the shadows aren't as dark, the transitions are smoother. So that is usually what I do if I'm photographing a subject with a little darker skin. That doesn't mean I don't shoot soft boxes on, <coughs> on pale people like me, but all right. So it looks good so far. Um, take a look at one more thing is in a small space, let's say I didn't have a background light and I wanted to light my background, I could feather the umbrella over. When I point the umbrella at the background, a little closer, Stephen, great. Notice in this shot, I'll have light on my background because I pointed the umbrella that direction. However, if I feather it across, now watch, exact same shot, or exact same uh, everything, the only thing that changed is I feathered my umbrella, I pointed it off the background, and it's gone. So that's part of why feathering, feathering is important. People always think, oh, I got to take my softbox or my umbrella and point it at the center of their face, and that's, that's not true, and it's giving me an important tool for changing what my background looks like. So actually, I want to cut the difference, okay? I want a little light but not a lot. So let's try there and try one more. Good. Thank you. By the way, as I'm focusing, how I shoot is I use back button focus. So I'm using the button, the AF button on the back of my camera, I have it set so that I use that to focus. Okay, I'm using that button to focus and I'm using my shutter to actually, or my, my trigger here to take the picture. So I focus, so if you see me do this, I sometimes will focus like this. That's what's going on. Um, the next thing is, is I'm setting individual focus points. So I use single focus point or the really small group, and I'm placing it on the eye closest to the camera. So I know that that's going to be the sharpest. If you look at the settings I'm using here, I'm shooting at f11. So I know that even if she's turned away, both eyes will be in focus. At f11, she's going to be sharp. If I wanted to kick the background out of focus, and shoot wider open, I could, but I gotta be more careful with where I place that focus point. All right, so let's take one more, Steven, come back this way. Let's figure this out for what I want. Up a little closer. Great. Okay, so I like it, but I think that she looks kind of queen-like and regal, and I think she, like her hair and her body is maybe blending into the background a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on a background light. So this setup will be a total of two lights. One light on the subject, one light on the background, and then a reflector up to the front. So the light that I've selected for the background is a grid. And what grids do is they focus the light. And technically, if you're a real nerd, it's increasing the fall off of light. It's the same thing, it's focusing the light. This is what's happening. And so um, grids come in different sizes. The smaller the number, the more focused it will be. So I think of it like this. Small number, small area, it lights. So that's, what size is that one? Okay, so this is a 20 degree grid. Um, and so 20 degree grid is giving me a little bit more spread. With my pro photo lights, I have five, 10, and 20. Different brands, your numbers will vary. Just know smaller is tighter, bigger number is wider. So I'm gonna place this behind her to give her a little bit of separation from the background. And then, and then maybe like a little bit of glow from behind her. It'll look like one of those old fashioned paintings where she's got like almost a halo behind her. So let's, let's give this a try again. All right. Looks good. Let me see. Um, you said that's a 20? Yep. I would like it to be a little tighter. I want it to be smaller. Can you grab me a 10, please? Yep. So what we're going to do, and don't move the light at all. We're just going to show them the exact same thing. So 10 is going to focus it behind her just a bit more. So look, the spread will not be as dramatic. Right? So I've got a little bit more of that halo. Okay, so I think I've got my light all set, and now it's time to photograph her. So I need to ask myself a couple of questions, and so it would be, what, what's the idea behind my posing? In this case, if I were going for an old painting, I would look at inspiration of poses in old paintings. So where the arms should go, where, how the hands should be, because it might be different than traditional posing. Um, so let me start with that, and, and I also think, because since she's a queen, she's regal, I might shoot a lower camera angle than I would usually shoot because I want her to look powerful on her throne. So uh, I'm going to shoot a little bit further back, a little bit lower angle, 
maybe like a 50 millimeter focal length. We'll try something around there. Um, so perfect, just like that. Hand on your thigh a little bit more perfect and then put your hand up to your chest right there. Great, perfect. And Steven, that little flap on the reflector is visible. Thank you. Okay, and bring it back in close. Great. And chin up a little. Perfect. Great, and now hands soft to the side of your face. Perfect, and then hide your thumb to your index finger. Great, and wiggle them real soft. Beautiful. Great. And then chin to the light. Oh, great, and now give me real soft eyes. Beautiful. Um, notice, I mean, now I'm saying this will be weird because she obviously hears me say this. Notice uh, how my voice changes. Like, perfect. Like, I give them, I'm like, I'm sculpting with my voice. Uh, when I direct people, uh, I'm trying to do that. I'll say, okay, turn your chin to your left. Just a little bit to your left. Great. Tilt your head back towards me. Oh, perfect. And so I'm like coaching them and letting them know what I like. So that, that's how I talk uh, when I'm photographing someone. Um, so I like it, but it's not super queenly to me yet. So let me try a couple more poses. Um, can you try that hand on your thigh, like, uh, your right hand on your thigh, and then the other hand on top of it to here? Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like that looks like a queen pose. Maybe be holding a scepter or something. Okay, let's try that. Good. Turn your body a little bit more to your left and then pull your elbow back a little bit more. Yeah, pretty. Um, Joseph, can you move the, the grid to the right a little? Um, I want the light a little more centered behind her. Right now it's a little bit f too far to the left-hand side. So I want that little bit of glow. And pull those other arms back one more time. Good. A little less, a little less. Perfect. And then, yeah, curl the fingers. Beautiful. Great. So pretty. Okay, so now what I want to try is I want to try a couple close-ups. I think with the close-ups, I'm going to come in and shoot at a higher angle because it'll make her eyes look bigger and it'll be a little bit softer. So it won't be as strong and queenly and regal, but it'll be more connection to camera. Okay, just like that. Good. And look your head into the light here. Yeah, beautiful. And turn your shoulders a little bit further. Bring your, your elbow uh, to a forward. Yeah. Uh, right now, she's turning her shoulders a little bit broad to me. Like there. See how she got wider? So I'm just trying to narrow it just a bit. Great. And then look your eyes here. Perfect. Great. Okay, so... I'm gonna try one more funky thing. And I noticed with her outfit, she's got this epic cape. Um, I would probably with more time stand her up and try things like that. But actually, since I'm seeing this and I'm seeing it looks like a painting, it looks almost kind of religious, I'm actually gonna turn this into a veil. Perfect. Okay, and I'm gonna have you turn a little bit this side. Great, and then come back towards me. Yeah, a little less, and then hands one on top of the other. So let's try a couple of those shots. Beautiful. Yeah, so pretty, so pretty. Gorgeous, you look great. I think there's a little bit too much veil on this side, so I'm just gonna shrink it just a little bit. You look wonderful. I think I'm squishing your hair. Hold on, let me just go up a little more there. Great, now try one hand higher and one hand lower. Perfect. Great. Okay, now, before I am done shooting, once I've decided, yeah, this is my light, like this is what the light is going to be, I have to get a picture of my color checker. Um, okay, so my color checker, what it's going to be is it's going to be my reference for color. So if this shot is all gold and warm tone and I've got the wrong white balance, it's not gonna work. And one thing to notice, if you are shooting auto white balance, I'm right now shooting on the flash preset, take a look at auto. Let's see how it does. I haven't tested it yet, but I'm sure it won't work for it. Oh, yeah. Okay, auto. Okay. That's what auto gives me. Here's why. Auto's reading all the red in the scene and also the red in her skin tone. It goes, oh, it's warm. We need to cool it down. We're going to cool it down and add some blue. And then when you add blue to her skin, she's gonna, it's going to look gray. It's going to look desaturated. There's a huge difference. So do not shoot. Oh, do not shoot auto white balance. 
Again, here's before, here's after. Um, for my, my particular studio strobes here, I know that they work best with a preset of flash white, uh, the flash white balance. A lot, a lot of strobes aren't accurate like that. So, I mean, so I absolutely shoot my color checker either way. And I can actually just take a picture of the gray card because I'm going to use this in Lightroom as a reference point. So let me just make sure I get this right. So even if you mess up, even if you shot auto white balance, which is awful, I can fix it later. Great. OK, so let's, yeah, OK, perfect. Let me shoot like one more. Good, and chin up to the light. Perfect. And put your right arm forward, uh, like all the way this way. Yeah, perfect. Great. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, retouch or edit one really quickly. And then we're going to look at a totally different concept. So this is Golden Goddess, Warm, all of that. So if you shoot your color checker, your gray card, and if you got your color incorrectly, what you would do is in Lightroom, you grab your little eyedropper white balance. So I'm actually in the develop module. And I'm going to grab my eyedropper. It's the white, uh, the white balance selector. And when I click on this, what I'm saying is this is a neutral uh, card. This is neutral. And so what it does is, do you see that difference? Watch. Here's before, here's after. She went from pale and washed out and kind of, kind of bluish to having a lot warmer tones to her skin. So again, I can select it, and it gives me the correct white balance, and it gets rid of color cast. So if you do this, I do this even if I didn't shoot the wrong white balance, because it's not all light is just right on. So what I'll do is I'll shoot it in the beginning or the end of the shoot, and then I sync it up. So I sync it up with every other photograph so they all have the correct white balance. And so in Lightroom, it's pretty easy to do that. I can select that corrected photo, and then I start with that one, and then I select all the way back. I hit sync settings, and I synchronize. You just have to make sure the white balance is set correctly. So it's going to sync them. All right, so you can see you're getting kind of the right warmth. OK, so the next thing that I want to do is I want to start working on my exposure just a little bit. And so I, I'm just going to mess around with a couple settings. Um, there is not really an exact process, but because I'm shooting on a, and working with a calibrated monitor, I'm actually seeing the file that I'm working with. I'm not really guessing. So I can say, OK, I want this brighter. If it looks good brighter, make it brighter. If you want more detail in the shadows, add more detail in the shadows. It's, it's fine. It's a creative process. So I'm going to look at it here. And I feel like it's a little dark. And guess what? Take a look at my histogram. Yes, this picture is predominantly darker tones, but if you look, it's, it's all kind of gathered on the left-hand side. And what I'm mousing over now, you see where I have the blue. What that means is that is areas of my photo that are so dark that it's not holding detail. In a print, if you want a good quality print, even in the darkest areas, you want a little detail, just, like, just a little bit of detail. So I'm going to do something to bring that back. So let's uh, bring up my shadows. Oh, that fixed it, right? I just I brought up my shadows to get a little bit more detail. I think the picture's a little dark. I'm going to brighten that up a little bit. Um, that looks good. However, I was going for golden goddess, like golden queen. And so I'm actually going to, in this example, mess up my white balance on purpose. The gray card did a great job of helping me get rid of any color cast as well. But I decided I wanted her to be warmer than reality, because we're going for warm, warm, warm all the way across. So I'm going to warm up my color temperature, really warm. See how golden it all, it all gets? It warms up. But obviously, it's, it's probably a little bit too warm. So I'm, I'm just messing around with things. But I'm going uh, to decrease my vibrance. Let's maybe pop the clarity a little bit. Uh, let's brighten up the picture a tiny bit, increase my contrast. I'm just kind of messing around with things. So let's see where I have before and after so far. Let's see here. So it's pretty similar. Let's go like a little bit warmer. Maybe something like that, okay? So I'm going for like a little bit warmer on this side of the frame, a tiny bit warmer. Um, let's take a look at applying this to some other shots. 
Let's see. Thinking, checking. Okay, so nice sharp focus on that. Let me apply that, that effect to some other shots. Again, you can select the first one, click all the way to the last frame, sync settings, I'm making sure everything's checked, but crop, because I don't want it to sync the crop, it's going to apply that effect to everything after it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly cull. Cull means go through these and figure out which one I like best. I don't have a lot of time here, um, and I want to retouch this briefly. So what I usually do is when I go through, anything that I would consider, this is, my, this is not the right way to do this, it's just what I do. Anything that I would consider, I give three stars. And then I go back and I look at the three stars, and I either bump it up to, yes, I'm going to edit this, or I bump it down to, no, this didn't make the final cut. Um, yeah, I like that one. I think that might be the one I edit. I don't have too much time to work with here. Okay, yeah, let's, let's edit that one. So in Lightroom, what I would be fixing would be color, exposure, contrast, all of that. Let's just... Just a little bit, so I'm going to crop in. Um, I messed around with my exposure, so it's looking pretty good. Um, and let's just make it a little bit paler for creative purposes. All right. All right, I like it. So we're going to go with that. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I would do in Lightroom, but I would really do all my skin editing in Photoshop. So I'm going to open up in Photoshop CC. So I'm going to open it anyway. And so when you print this out, if you look at the skin tone next to her, if I, if in this particular case, it'll be a little bit warmer. Let's come in. I'm going to duplicate my background. And I'm going to pop in, and I'm at like 175%. Um, I'm going to just get rid of some blemishes. So the tool that I'm going to use is I'm going to use my spot healing brush. This isn't a retouching class because obviously in two hours I'm teaching and doing things start to finish. So if you want to know more about my retouching techniques, you can go to the Learn with Lindsay website. But this is spot healing and all I'm doing is I'm basically saying to Photoshop, hey, whatever I'm mousing over here, this is whatever I'm clicking over, this is not good, this doesn't belong here. Take a guess and replace it for me. I'm basically leaving it up to Photoshop to guess. There are other tools that give you a little bit more control, but I'm telling Photoshop it doesn't belong. If I were really retouching this, I would probably take about 40, 40 minutes to retouch this image in its entirety, just so you have an idea of how much time I really spend. So let's pop around. Okay. Looks good. All right, so I don't have too much time, so I'm going to go real short. Um, and then let me just do something that you do not think you'll know what this is. I'm going to do something called frequency separation. Uh, if you don't know it, add it to your to learn list down the line. I think one of the most useful things for me watching other photographers work was figuring out what I didn't know I didn't know, right? Like figuring out, oh, I've never heard of that. Um, and so basically what it lets me do is I can retouch the skin. See how it's all blurry? I can retouch the skin to smooth out weird transitions. You know, like if it's a little bumpy here or the shadow under the eye here. I can smooth things out and then I have my texture in a top layer so I always can add it back on. So this is what I'm actually doing. I'm, I'm retouching on color and tone and not messing up my texture. So let me work on this for a minute. All right. Beautiful. Okay, I'm doing a little bit more. Won't spend too much longer on this. Good. And I said I would get rid of kind of all anything that's bumpy, that's not important to skin te skin texture, but actually would be a blemish or a distracting texture. All right, so this is pretty good. I think the only other thing that I would get rid of would be this uh, little spot next to her mouth, and then maybe clean up her lips. So let's get rid of this. Okay. All right, that's good. And let me fix her lips just a little bit. Okay. All right. So I'm using my spot healing again. And I'd go in there more carefully. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's zoom out. She's looking really beautiful. 
Um, let's take a look at the before after. It was not severe. Okay, so here's the before. Here's the after. Just, just evening out tones, cleaning up blemishes. I would spend more time. Um, other, I don't really think there's too much else I would do to this image. Uh, if I'm retouching, I do something called contouring, where I paint on highlights and shadows. Maybe I'll do a quick round of that. And then I'm going to send it off to get printed. All right, so let's just contour just a little bit. I'm adding curves layer, one lighter, one darker. And I'm going to selectively paint on highlights. Again, not a retouching class. I just wanted to show you kind of the actual tools that I'm working with. So I'm painting on her highlights of her cheekbones. Going on the shadows. Okay. All right, so just take a look at, I just popped out the detail in her face just a little bit. All right, here's before, here's after, I'm just popping stuff out. Gonna add a little bit of highlight. Okay, so I'm gonna go with that and I'm gonna pass it off to you. Usually, uh, oh yeah, so when you edit, I edit in 16-bit RGB TIFFs, but I'm gonna deliver it to him in this case um, as a JPEG, we're, it's just because we're printing it out real fast, so. All right, so I'm gonna do one more set. Totally different mood, totally different concept. Okay guys, so our concept on the last shoot was gold and warm and clean and regal, and now this is just real expensive and teal. I'm going the exact opposite. Rich colors, um, she just looks expensive. Thank you. Uh, and if anyone saw me do my last live stream here at me and H, she was also my model because she's wonderful and lovely and I think she's fantastic. Okay, so what I've done is I've got another gravity backdrop, in this case teal, and we've got a teal uh, outfit thing and I'm gonna make it teal, 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 teal. But I'm now using the other modifier that I use. The modifier that I use um, most often besides the umbrella, and this is called a beauty dish. Um, and I'm gonna have you uh, pop off the, the grid for me. A beauty dish is fantastic because it's kind of the best of both worlds when it comes to uh, a lighting modifier because you get the beautiful, forgiving, glowing light that you would get from a softbox, but you've got more contrast and more control. It's, it's just got, it's got more pop to it. So I'm going to be able to change the direction of the light and control it a lot more than I can with a softbox or an umbrella. So right now, these lights are off. The only light that is on is my main light, okay? So let's, let's just take a look at this. Um, I do believe I need the house lights dimmed if you would, please and thank you, so we can actually see what's going on. So just the beauty dishes on at the moment. So let me take one quick shot, just like this. Okay, so I like it so far. Let me see. I like it so far. See, like, see that glow? that the beauty dish gives you, it gives you like, it gives you more pop, more contrast. The shadows are darker. Um, the, the edge of the, the shadow on the nose is a little bit more crisp. It's not hard, but it's a little bit more crisp and the, it's still glowy on her skin. Um, so this is the beauty dish. If you notice, there is a little bit of light reaching the background, but let's say that I want to light the background like the last one. Well, with a beauty dish, when you feather, it doesn't really work that way. You can't feather as much, because watch, when I feather, she's getting the raw edge of the light on her face, and so it's hard light. It's not the glowing light bouncing off the center panel. So I can't really feather to avoid the background light. So instead, what I'm going to do is we're gonna add a grid. Um, grids do focus the light, but they also, and really what it's doing, is making the light fall off faster. So what this means is that same light will hit her face, but it's not gonna reach the background. So now, this, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I haven't changed my camera settings. The only difference is, is we added a grid to the beauty dish. And there are grids that can go right directly on your lights. There are grids that can go on soft boxes. There are grids that can go on beauty dishes. So I'm gonna take a shot now that we've added the grid on. And I dropped my grid so I made it a little bendy. Okay, here we go. Test. Okay. So nothing changed except for I added a grid. Like background is gone. So if you're ever in a small space, and you really are trying to separate the difference of your subject in the background and the main light spilling, consider adding a grid. It gives you a lot more control. So that's exactly what I did here. So the next thing I want to do is I know I want this to be really teal and I kind of want it to be funky. Um, I, I, I think what I'm going to do is play up color, right? It's teal, teal. I'm going to play up the color and I'm going to add 
teal to the shadows. I want, I want, it, I want a gel part of this shot. When I light with gels, one of the things that I know is that gels show up most in shadow areas. How I think of it is I think of the shadow like it's, it's a dry spot and when you give it water, you give it light, soaks it up. So in this instance, let me take one more shot, raise this up just a bit. So in this instance, can you turn your head just a teeny bit to the, yeah, perfect. Let me take one shot, okay, so and then chin right to me right there, perfect. Okay, so take a look at the shadows on uh, the, the left hand side of the face. There's a ton of shadows in it, okay, right? Um, by the way, I'm shooting in um, auto white balance, which you shouldn't do. Did you notice how the color shifted? This is why you, you have to control your color. So I'm going to go back to my flash white balance preset. And once I get my lighting set, I'm going to take another picture of the color checker. All right, so watch those shadows. Let me take one more so I got the color consistent. Okay, so don't move. Same thing. Now I'm going to add a gel, and I'm going to add a teal gel. Uh, there's nothing fancy. I just have this gel uh, taped on the front of a zoom reflector. We need more tape. It's uh, yeah, more gaffer's tape. So now what's going to happen is if you watch those shadows, that's where the gel shows up. That's how gels work. So I'm going to take the exact same shot, hand to your chest again for me, watch the same thing, and watch where you see gels. in the shadows, like that's exactly where it goes. And I already love that shot, like it's getting that feel that I want. Um, I like to gel the shadows because it adds mood or it has a concept. So my concept in this case is teal. So it looks really good. Um, if I want more teal on her face, I have to create more shadow from the main light. If I want less teal on her face, I create less shadow from the main light or I can turn her face. So watch, turn your head to the main light for me, great. And now turn your head toward the other direction. So if you watch, in the first shot, it's mostly in the jawline, not actually on the center of her face. But when I turn her face the other direction, it's in her eyes a little bit more. So just know, wherever you create shadows, that's where you see gels. So I like the idea of where we're going here. Um, but I would like to see some light on the background. But I, I don't want to like wash out the whole thing. Um, so I'm going to have you add... Uh, a light with a grid. So we're going to do a grid again. What, do, what grid do you have on? Ten. So let's try it. We're going to try it with 10 degree grid. I need. I want a little glow to pick up that background. Um, yeah, just leave it on for a second. All right, let's try it. And turn, turn it up really high. So I've got a purple gel on here. I want to see if I like it, playing with color. Um, it's interesting. I think I need a wider grid. Basically, that means that right now it's hidden behind her body. I need a grid that'll light a little bit more. So we're going to switch it from a 10 to a 20. 20 is going to give me more spread. Um, I'm going to take one more shot with the purple, but I think I'm going to probably skip it. I think I'm just going to skip to teal, teal, teal. But let's let's try the purple. I'll try one more. Beautiful. Let's see. Yeah, okay, uh, so I'm have you remove the, the gels for me, and then you probably have to turn the power down a little bit, but let's, let's test it. And um, right now, you can see from the main light that the, the grid, let's turn on. There you go, the grid, it's not a perfect circle behind her. It's because we're pointing from the side, so can you bring it in and point it back more? I want it to be a little bit more circular. All right, yeah, and then, yeah, let's try this. Okay. Yeah, so that, I think that's looking really pretty. Um, yeah, I like it. So I've got teal on her, teal on the shadows, teal on the background, teal all the way across. So I think that's the light that I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to grab a picture with my color checker right now that I've got the light right. However, what the color checker is going to do is it's going to get rid of um, color cast. Well, this is a color cast that I want to keep on purpose. So I'm actually going to turn this off so that it's not considering that. Um, how I need to have her hold the color checker is she needs to hold it in the light, in this case, in the light that is illuminating her. And she needs to hold it this direction up, okay? And so you'll see it's actually when the faces are the right side up. I'm going to take a picture of this. We're going to use this later because I'm going to use it to get the correct colors. Right now, I, I, it's probably not going to be the right vibrancy. 
So I'm gonna have you hold it. Oh, and don't let them touch their fingers to the uh, to the the colors here because these colors are actually pigments and it will shift the tones of it. So I want to make sure that she's holding on to the sides, nice and close to the light on her face. Thank you. Perfect, let me take one more just in case. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna shoot a little bit. Let me check my time, perfect. Okay, let me shoot a couple frames of her like this. Um, can you, yeah, turn to your right a little bit and look your head back to the light. Perfect, and try something with your hand up. Great, perfect, okay, great. And let me see that ring, beautiful. Chin up, good. Take a look at that. So far, looking good. And this is also, again, I shoot tethered because I'm gonna make sure I like the lines, I like the light. There's nothing weird about the hair or makeup that I need to change. So I like it. I might turn down this gel just a bit, maybe a little strong, but it's, I mean, it's fitting the concept that I'm going for. Okay, good, beautiful. And I'm focusing using a single focus point or a small group. Those are the two that I use. So I've got a small group and I'm focusing on that closest to camera. So let's try that again. Okay, okay let's do uh, the hand up and pop the collar one more time. Yeah, beautiful. Good, and chin to the light again. Good, and cross that, that front arm way over. Yeah, just like that. And bring your elbow in even more. Perfect. Trying to make a triangle. And chin up a little. Good. Good. Notice my recycle times. <laughs> I shoot quickly. I'm going to know it's going to be full power and give me the right exposure every time. So one more lean way out. And then chin back up. And you can pull that elbow out again if you need. Good. Uh, maybe put your hand in front. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. And one more at me. And I'll take this in. Great. So I'm going to select from one of those. So, thank you, that's thank it. You. Are you leaving before I say goodbye? Let me get a hug. Bye, love. <laughs> I'll see you soon. I'll see, maybe I'll see you in LA next week. Okay. Yay, Daria! Okay, so, I like that shot, for example. I'm gonna star it, because I don't have a ton of time to cull. Um, but let me just show you. So before, one of the ways that I was using the color checker um, was just to get kind of a gray card. Another way that I use it is, do you see these little, where, where the people are, they have multiple colors of gray? What I can do is I can actually select a different color gray to cool down a photo or to warm it up. But I never understood what all this stuff was for, okay? I saw some, yeah, okay. Um, for me, I've noticed that when I shoot certain colors and in certain lighting situations, like when I shoot certain things, the colors aren't right. They're not the same as I'm seeing with my eye. And it's not like I'm. It's not like in the print. It's like like right away. It's not right. Like um, like bright red in the sun. Or for me, I see that like purples never look quite right. And it just has to do with our sensors and our lenses. So what this does is each one of these actually each one of these um, squares has a value. Each color has a specific value. So it's, it's a specific CMYK RGB value. So when you take a picture of this. I'm going to show you in Lightroom, um, there's a plug-in. And so the plug-in in Lightroom, it'll know exactly what color blue that is, exactly what color yellow that is, that exactly what color pink that is. And so what it'll do is it will make it the correct color, and it puts your colors back to where they're supposed to be. And so for me, this is really important. Um, I mean, again, if you're photographing pinks and purples, but for me as a fashion photographer, the other thing that I notice is sometimes I'll shoot something super saturated, and it just looks dull. Like it's, it doesn't have that same pop as I'm actually, like as I, I'm seeing with my eyes, so why isn't translating? And a lot of times it's this. So I, I, it's me not doing my custom color profile. That's what I'm creating. I'm creating a color profile, not just getting the right white balance. You can do both, but the custom color profile will help with the color in this instance. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna show you how to do that first. Um, I'm gonna grab this picture, for example. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna crop in so that I'm just getting those colors on the bottom. 
So I'm going to crop in to somewhere around there. I mean, just have to be close. It's fine. Let's see? OK. Uh, they actually give you the little crop lines on the side. All right. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to download the plugin. And this is what the plugin looks like. Uh, it is free on x -Rite's website. So if this is the x -Rite Passport Color Checker. This is their custom color profile uh, plugin. So you go to their website, download it. There's a Mac and there's a PC one. Um, and you would load it into Lightroom. Let me see this. You would load it into Lightroom. I'm trying to move this out of the way. Hold on. Okay. Um, under File and then Plugin Manager. So this is where you would install your plugin. I use it, so obviously I've already got it installed and running. And so what you do is for each different lighting situation, lens, and camera, so in this case, I'm going to create one. Um, what you do is you, you export to get a custom color profile. So you would go to File, Export with Preset Color Checker Passport. I'm going to name it. I'm going to hit Save, and it's going to take a second, and it's going to process it. So it's looking at it, and it's saying, OK, here's the colors you have. Here's the colors that it should be. And it's going to create a custom profile specifically for this exact situation to get everything right. So it takes a minute for it to process, and I do actually have to restart Lightroom to bring it back up so I have that option for uh, my colors. So let me give it a second, and I will go grab that. Perfect. So it says, the profile has been generated successfully. Lightroom must be restarted, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to quit Lightroom, restart it, and I'll show you where you get this profile. So let me restart Lightroom. And it's going to be over in the develop module, OK? So where you do your develop settings. But all the way down at the bottom. So all the way, all the way down at the bottom under camera calibration. I've, I do this all the time, and many photographers don't know to do this. If you go to profile, there's all of these different camera profiles. Do you ever see, like, oh, here's a perfect example. Um, in, in the back of your camera, when you can set standard or neutral, your, your your picture profile, you can set your um, picture, picture style, thank you. Uh, you set your picture style. Well, when you're shooting a raw, it doesn't really matter because it's not like baked in. But then sometimes you shot with a specific picture, uh, picture style, and then you bring it up in Lightroom, and it doesn't look the same as what you shot because it's, it's putting it in with, in, in this case, the Adobe standard. But there's different ones here. So I actually just created one with B&H Session 2, OK? Watch what happens. When I click on this, watch the colors. So if you notice that a lot of them got more saturated. So let's go back. A lot of them got more saturated. So here you go. Ready? This is the picture profile, the color profile. Some of the colors got more saturated and some of them shifted because what I was capturing was not accurate to what like, those colors actually were. So now what I can do is I can go back and sync this or apply this profile to the scene here. And so, for example, when I was trying with the purple, I can go down to that setting and I can grab it again, you know, the, the b and Session 2. Watch the purples. See how they got just a little more saturated? So ready? Here's before, here's after. It, it shifted the color a little bit and got more saturated. So for me, when I su shoot super saturated tones, a lot of times when I'm looking at it and it's not right, I don't want to just pump up the saturation because it does it in all these different weird places. If I get my color profile right, then it pumps up the color correctly in the right places so that when I send it to print, it still looks good. All right, so I'm going to make sure I apply that all the way across to all of these. And uh, I'm going to mess around with color a little bit more, uh, but not color exposure. So let's, let's look at the photo that I've chosen. I just synced that profile all the way across. Uh, people often ask me how I get the really pale porcelain looking skin. I mean, part of it's in camera, right? Like, it's, it's the way it's lit. It's the way the lighting is. It's the way the makeup is. It's also a pale subject. So it's all of those things added together. But there is a little bit more that I do in Lightroom. So what, where I mess with the, the color of the skin tone and pale it out is I do so in the Hue Saturation Luminance panel. Because I can go into Saturation and see this little dot in the top left-hand corner. That's a targeted adjustment. So I can click on the skin and drag down, and it desaturates it. And I can go all the way to gray, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just back it off a little bit. And so if you notice, the reds and yellows and oranges, in this case, it's her red and oranges, uh, shifted a little bit, desaturated, because that's what the skin tone is, reds, yellows, and oranges. So that's why I desaturated those when I dragged. 
But then when I decrease the saturation in people's skin, a lot of times they look gray, they look kind of dead. So I usually lighten it back up. I do the same thing. I switch over to luminance. Luminance means light. And I'm going to grab that targeted adjustment. And now, same targeted adjustment, I'm going to click up and lighten up that skin. Lighten up the skin just a bit. So that should be pretty good. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to do. Maybe pop the clarity a little bit. I'm going to lighten up the photo a tiny bit. I think that's probably pretty good there. Let's fill in the shadows. Okay, so now I'm going to pop this over into Photoshop and do my final, my final retouch to it. And she doesn't really have much to her skin to clean up, so photo, edit in, Photoshop CC. Uh, by the way, again, I will put up at the end the link to where you can get this presentation, so for all those notes, but also it'll have those two presets. So the color adjustment I did to Imani, the first girl, the golden, I've got the preset that I created in Lightroom there, as well as this preset. So I'm, it'll be uploaded um, whenever you check it. All right, so let's just do a couple more tweaks to her. I'm going to zoom in, and I mean, how lovely working with models in this case. I, I chose to work with, I, I selected my subjects with uh, some beautiful skin this time because I knew I had such a short amount of time for retouching. Uh, but obviously, retouching is part of the process. And so any subject that I photograph, um, I, I treat them with the same fashion style or the same uh, as a piece of artwork, even if they need a little more skin cleanup. All right, cleaning up the skin, and then I will send this one off to print as well, so you guys will be able to take a look at the end. Okay, I'm finishing this up here, and I promise this isn't actually just like me saying a, a Canon commercial. I used to have another printer forever ago, and I had to do so much cleaning, and I had to do like when things would get clogged, and it, that doesn't exist anymore with the Canon printers. Like you don't have to do that type of stuff. Like it's, it just works. Like I've, I've had the printer now for a year and a half, and I haven't had to do any maintenance. I just change the ink when it needs to be changed, and then it's done. All right, so all I did, if you want to see, is I just cleaned up her skin just a little bit. So here's before, here's after, just getting rid of distractions. But that's good to go for now. And all I did was um, blemish removal and a little frequency separation. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to pass it off to him. And then I'm going to do a little bit of a wrap up. All right. Man, I like the detail on this. Look at that. Super pretty. And so again, this was the Mark IV, and this is zoomed in at almost 200%, so got lots of detail. All right, let me transfer that now. Again, I edit as a 16-bit RGB TIFF, but in this case, I'm sending him a file that can print easily right now. All right, sending it over. Okay, guys, so a um, couple things that I want you to take away and that I would like you to, to have from this. Oh, and let me put up the notes one more time, just in case. Here are those notes for the, that Lightroom preset, as well as, uh, as well as the notes for the class. All right, so first of all, the first thing I want you to keep in mind is start with an idea, start with the concept, and then build other things off of it. Because with the first model, if I had her being queen-like and regal, and I had her doing this, you know, uh, the, the strong lines like a fashion model pose or this, it doesn't make sense, right? I should be posing her in a regal way. So when you start with the why and what's the purpose and the story that you're telling, or who, uh, what you're trying to showcase, it helps educate all the rest of your decisions. Uh, the next thing that I wanted you to think of or realize as well is the preparation part. You know, when I, when I plan ahead, I give myself good things to, to work with, and I didn't know I was going to use a gel, and I didn't know uh, exactly how I'd pose her, but I knew the idea was to go with all teal, and I wanted it to be teal all the way across so I, I, could, I could plan ahead and get the background of the clothing or whatever it may be. Uh, and then the last part is, when you plan ahead and when you have a concept, when you have a style, you're not a commodity anymore. And you're not competing on price and you're not necessarily trying to do volume, but instead you can create work that you're proud of and that it's worthy of being a piece of artwork on someone's wall. And hopefully the two images that you'll see, I have, I'll have them out here, you can come take a look. I think that they would be images that are worthy of being wall art. I hope you think the same. So uh, thank you to everyone that sponsored me here today. Canon and Profoto and X-Ray and Tether Tools. Those people are the brands that I use in everything I do, but they're also really supportive. Uh, thank you for B&H for bringing me and all my lovely people out here. I'm going to take questions after, so thank you.